Hi, my name is Megha Murthy and I'm the editor-in-chief of Round Glasses Tape. We're in the beautiful city of Srinagar to shoot another episode of In Conversation where I speak with eminent conservationists on their journey to try and protect India's wild spaces and species. Our guest today is very special. Bittu Segal is the founder of the Sanctuary Nature Foundation and the founder editor of Sanctuary Asia, India's first wildlife and ecology magazine. He has been involved with Project Tiger since its inception in the 1970s. He also created Kids for Tigers, the very successful program that has run for over two decades and reached over a million children. When we asked the man himself where he'd like to have this conversation, to our pleasant surprise, he said the Dachigam National Park because of the connection he shares with the park and all the wonderful work that he has done here. Needless to say, all of us at Sustain were very excited to be here and speak with Bittu Segal. for agreeing to do this. I'm just utterly delighted. It's wonderful to be here, isn't it? Yes. In, Kashmir. In Srinagar, yeah. My good Lord, yes. Everybody should come to Kashmir to know what life is like. I couldn't yeah. agree more. I want to start with uh, talking to you about, uh, you know, your growing up years. You were born in Shimla and you grew up in Kolkata. So what were your uh, formative years like? How did nature become a part of your, uh, of your life? It was visceral. I, I really don't have any one particular thing that said, now I'm in love with nature. I think it just took me over. Osmosis. I'm actually a Kolkata wala, you know. I mean, I, I, I went there as a kid. My father was with the Life Insurance Corporation, so I've been to 11 schools in nine years. And then actually from Calcutta, I'd gone back to Simla and I studied in Bishop Cotton School. There, everything was nature, everything. We took it for granted. We never thought much about the forest. We never thought much about the fact that you'd hear, you know, all kinds of you know, animal sounds at night. When I went back, 10 or 15 years later, I had no idea why the tears were streaming down. Mm -hmm. So much had been destroyed. And I realized then that that was part of me. And uh, it was like somebody had torn something out of me, and taken and it away. that was an instinctive reaction. That was to... an instinctive reaction. And I think that was really the trigger that made me decide that my life would be this. You went on to sort of, uh, you know, work in advertising. You were selling plastic buckets and toothpaste and whatnot. And then you had that uh, famous conversation with Fateh Singh Rathor where, <laughs> you know, he told you that, you know, you city walas will just come here and go on safaris and go back. If you want to do something, you start sanctuary. This is Absolutely. a well-known story. But Absolutely. what I want to know yeah. is, uh, what what went on in your mind? Did you just decide to take the plunge? I mean, you had, from what I know, you had no background in journalism, in publishing. Was the love of nature enough for you to just take the plunge and do this immediately? Or I don't happened? know if it was the love of nature, it was the love of Fateh, it was the love of Ranthambor. And I was diametrically opposed, you know. I mean, it wasn't just selling plastic buckets. I was selling 220 litre plastic buckets to the chemical industry at the age of 17. I was doing BCom in the morning and... That was what I did. So from there, if I shifted my life, it was not because of a decision I took. It was because I was taken over. So when he said this thing, I said, OK, I won't come back to Ranthambore ever again. Fine. But when I decided to do this, I discovered how difficult it was. I'd gone to WWF and I said, I'll start a magazine for you. I went to the BNHS. I said, I'll start a magazine. I'll do all the work, but I must do this thing. And at that point of time, it wasn't really the priority of either of these organizations, but it happened. It just happened. One after the other, the people I went to, the photographers, the writers, they just wanted, they wanted a place where they could speak or to publish. And there wasn't. When we produced the first issue, the first person I went to was Salim Ali. And I gave him this magazine. So he looked through it. And he's not a man of many words. Hmm. Congratulations, he said to me. 
So I thought, yeah, I was very happy, you know, congratulations. You've just invented two new species. <laughs> I had spelt them wrong. And that was a lesson for me, that use science, put it in good language, easy language to understand, but don't go wrong on your science. And get if you go facts. wrong, apologize. You know? Get the facts right. Yeah, get the facts yeah. right. Back then, it was so difficult to communicate because the mainline newspapers were not writing about this. So it took us much longer to establish the need to protect the biosphere then than it does now. So the other thing I've always wondered about is how did Randhir Sagal become Bittu Sagal? Oh my God, that was before, <laughs> that was because uh, Punjabi family, Bittu, Kukku, Munnu, Chunnu, all that happens. But in, in my case, my eldest sister told me that you were always called Beta, Betu, Betu, Betu and you became Bittu. In fact, when we got married, I had to go under some very minor surgical procedure and we just read the book Coma. And uh, he said that, look, in 10, 12 minutes, he'll be out of it. So 10, 15, 18, my wife fainted. She had to be given uh, smelling salts. And then she woke up and said, what are you, why isn't he? He said, we're keeping on saying, Randhi, Randhi, is not a say, Bittu. So he said, Bittu, and I, uh, I came out of it. Seriously, this was... This is a real story. It's a real story. It was in Breach Candy Hospital. Wow. And uh, I realized then that I was just bit. So we've had uh, crazy weather for the last two days, ever since we've landed here. So let's hope our trip to Dachigam is, happens today. And you can show us around this forest that means so much to you. Dachigam's been home for the last 40 years. And uh, more than that, you know. And... Actually, the weather doesn't matter. Whichever weather you go into Dachikam, other than the cameras that might get unhappy if right. they get wet. <laughs> right. But you use an umbrella and I'm used to it, so... Chalo then. Shall we? Yes. Get your yes. umbrella. Brave the rains and yep. uh, head out. Yep. Let's do that. Can't believe there you are. The sky seems to be clearing out a little bit. Well, you can okay. always pray. I can always hope. Yeah. The rain gods. This forest supplies half of all the water that the citizens of Srinagar depend upon. So I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, how Sanctuary started. Uh, it's been 40 years now. How did you start off? This forest we are in is very much a part of the birth of Sanctuary. Oh, did he? Because Sanctuary was born in Ranthambur. Mm -hmm. But we had two homes, my family. We had a home in Ranthambur and we had a home in Dachigam. So we would spend uh, days and days and days here and we held a, a children's camp here and uh, you know, it was national integration through conservation way back in the mid 80s. And I cannot tell you the change it's made to those children. We, we had about 15 children from Bombay and Delhi and we had about 15 children from Kashmir and they mixed and merged the way India should be mixed and merged. So, you know, you have spoken about the fact that you think that your generation has sort of um, failed, you know, to understand the importance of protecting the environment. Is that why you started talking to children? Is that how your project for uh, Kids for Tiger and Kids for Hangul, was that the starting point uh, you know, of those projects? Without a doubt. The children are different, you know. They don't have angles, they don't have cynicism, and they have the legitimacy to ask for a better tomorrow. Mm. Every child normally comes bundled with two parents. Mm. So through the children, we reach the adults. So it's an adult literacy program. Yes, I want to protect Dachi Gam. Yes, I want to leave a better world for my children. But I want to also leave better children for my world. That's why Sanctuary. That's why Kids for Tigers. That's why Cub Magazine and all these various things. So you were telling me um, this morning that when you started the Photography Awards, that you know people told you that you should give awards to famous people. <laughs> Right? Yes. Uh, and then you said that, you know, I'll get the famous people to give the awards, but yeah. I want lesser known people to sort of be in the spotlight. Yes, you see, because awards traditionally, whether it's film awards or sports awards, we give them to the people who are standing on the top of the podium. But with mud on their boots, the guys who are actually down there, unrecognized, 
not well equipped, not well paid, not well appreciated. It's on their shoulders that every single conservation body in the world is working. And what we said was that these are the people who are not known, but they should be recognized. But to get the attention, we got wonderfully well-known people to give it, like Julio Rivero gave away a prize to a small forest guard who was never heard of because he was protecting the forest against the equivalent of a mafia. He was put his life in danger every day, not from snakes and, and tigers and bears, but from people who were ready to shoot him because they wanted to kill a tiger. You know, So such things we did all over. It was not only forest guards, there were teachers quietly doing their job. So we had the Green Teacher Award. There were journalists putting their life at risk when they're opposing huge multi-crore projects and, and writing about it, you know. Appreciate and your Modern Boots project, which is such a wonderful initiative. I mean, how did that come about? That has a story. There is this little child, 12 years old. Her name is Kara Tejpal. She was our cub reporter. Her job was to report on everything. She is now one of India's finest conservationists. We did nothing. We only exposed her to the forest. And we exposed her to the stories. And she's writing stories on her own. And she took this idea that mud on boots, that's what makes a difference. So let's work for people who are not recognized and support them because we are top heavy. You know, lots of officers, lots of cars, lots of heavy equipment. But the guys over there still walking around with a lati and facing guys with guns. So Maron Boots, Cocoon Conservancy, Kids for Tigers, Sanctuary Asia, the films we make, it's all one amalgam. It's a khichdi of many things, all designed to keep... Which then becomes the Sanctuary Nature Foundation. Which became the Sanctuary Nature Foundation. And now I'm busy trying to make sure that the Sanctuary Nature Foundation, whether it survives or not, the issues that it's working on become internalized like breath. I think it's finally stopped raining. Yeah, it stopped bit. raining. Ah. Rain gods are answering our prayers. The rain gods are answering. At least momentarily. Ah. Beautiful. Look at it. Oh my good lord. So you have, you must have so many memories associated with Dachi Gam, no? Tell us about, you know, let's say one incredible sighting you had that you just can't get out of your mind. There are literally so many, but there, there is certainly one, you know. On that tar road that we, we drove by here with late Kasim Wani, who got a lifetime award from Sanctuary. At quarter to six in the morning, three days in a row, he brought us down, sat down on the tar road, and he knew where the bears would cross. So this mother bear with her two small roly-poly cubs came, left the cubs on the road, went up back to a mulberry bush, and picked up the fruit and came back and fed the young ones. I mean, it was all I could do to stop from crying with just the happiness of knowing that everything is working, you know. Then there was my friend, Mir Inayatullah. He was then the chief wildlife warden. And I don't know what to say. I walked into his office just asking for permission. I walked in, I met Inayat, and I walked out with a brother. He said, I permit not give you permission, I will That was... 40 years ago. He's not here with us anymore, nor is Kasim. But he lives in here. There are many, many, many more people like this. It's not just one person, you know. I mean, there are too many names to, to mention, and I'm sure with my lousy memory, I'll leave some names out, but I won't leave them from here. So, Mega, I want to take you to a place which is again a miracle. For Two and a half, three decades, we've been wanting the sheep farm to be moved out of this place because the competition for fodder was just too great for the hangul. It's been moved out. I cannot tell you, a year after it moved out, I came here and I was astounded by the way nature bounced back like a spring. And I was here with Nazir Malik at that point and around us, as we walked, 20 plus black bear eating the acorns, picking them up. That's what nature is. It just yeah. comes back. So here we are, this used to be a sheep farm, 4,000 sheep, hundreds of people moving up and down, no place for hangul, the hangul had to go outside, but today you see these horse chestnuts that they've planted, just a few of them, and suddenly the birds are coming back and pollinating the rest. It mm. took 20 to 30 years of screaming and shouting and begging and pleading, 
saying that look the sheep farm can go anywhere else the hangul cannot go anywhere else and the process unfolded and we're here in this miraculous place day 2 in dachigam let's hope today is a better day weather wise it looks like it might be yesterday was the second half of yesterday was a little bit of a washout no yeah washout for us but the forest loved it absolutely but we the moment we landed back in the hotel the, <laughs> the sun came know, it just it cleared out magically yeah yeah that's that's murphy's law you know so yeah but today yeah. is a new day lots of birds in no i think today will be a good day yeah actually every day is a good day for dachigam every single day is a good day yeah and it may not be a good day for filming but it's a good day for <laughs> dachigam that is true so here we go Yeah. Some, uh, sit for a bit. Yeah, let's let's move yeah. on. This is a nice spot to sit. To That's a nice place. Yeah. Want to rest? There we go. The good thing about the forest is you're never in a hurry. That is true. That is true. Do you think it's a privilege talking when we come to a place which has a certain amount of conflict, which is most forests in India? Let's say Dachigam, and tell people who live in the fringes of forests that we should protect the leopards and the bears, where they've had their kids, you know, taken away by leopards, and uh, you know, uh, their husbands and their family mauled by bears. So there is that certain anger towards these animals. I mean, and we know the importance of preserving these animals, but how how can we communicate this to them, and how do we? sort of uh, straddle that fine line between respecting their loss and understanding that sentiment and still you know doing what we need to for wildlife it seems and sounds like a very intractable problem mm. problem it isn't an intractable problem mm. actually mm. the first thing that must happen is that the policy makers the large businesses the bureaucrats the decision makers they have to understand that those people who live closest to this must have the first right to whatever benefits accrue whether those are from tourism whether those are from irrigation whether those are from drinking water whatever it is if you make sure ki aaj ke din mein humne jungle bana diya bhalu nikla they it raids their field that means the bhalu becomes a yamdoot so but if the bhalu becomes an annadata which is to say that we as a country as people living in bombay and delhi and every all the other place if we put enough let our opinions be known let our voice be heard that they are the rakshaks they are the they are the keepers of this forest and they must be the first beneficiaries and they must be respected mm. suddenly the equation changes mm. i'm not saying there'll be uniform Mm. equity all along it never has been it may never be mm. it's for us to see that what belongs to you as a villager living right outside dachigam is not taken by me turned into electricity for instance mm. and then sent off to delhi or wherever it is you know even i've thought about this often even things like eco tourism sometimes you know uh, at one level we are moving communities outside forests and at the other level we are promoting eco tourism so i mean I feel like something doesn't go hand in hand there, right? You are completely right. Mm. I think it doesn't make sense at all to move people out and then move hordes in. And that is the worst form of wildlife experience anybody can get. Sanctuary has actually come up with this thing which we've been experimenting for the last 5 years called cocoon conservancies. Mm. Community owned, community operated nature conservancies. these are outside our existing protected areas so when a tigress finds its cub is between 18 months and 24 months and it has to go out where does it go but if we can turn these marginal farms into even grasslands they don't have to be tall forests but places where visitors can stay on their properties 
experience the joys of having biodiversity spill over right next to them the way you would find in Africa or where you'd find anywhere else. But they should get paid. If I as a visitor go there, I should be able to pay 500 rupees or 1000 rupees and give them a livelihood that allows them to send their children to school, that allows them to live with dignity, with pride. This is my forest. These are my tigers. It's easier said than done. Though I think it has worked successfully in some places in the past, like uh, Spiti and Ladakh, where for the snow leopard, you know, all these homestays that have sprung up and, you know, is sort of pumping back into yep. the local economy. The snow leopard conservancy has completely and absolutely shown it works. Yeah. It needs to be replicated, yeah. but in every place you go to replicate it, even in Ladakh, the circumstances will be different and you have to be light-footed enough. The challenges are different. Yes. These are not wildlife programs. These are community yeah. upliftment programs designed by the community and implemented sensitively enough, keeping in mind that your gauge of success or failure is number one, has the quality of life of those people gone up? And number two, which could you could replace the numbers, has the biodiversity come back? Are you seeing more butterflies, more birds, more nematodes, more soil microflora? Are you seeing more trees? Are you seeing more fruit? What do you think of the uh, wildlife tourism uh, scene in India? Do you think that we are headed in the right direction? Do you think we are, we've completely lost the plot? I think we've lost the plot. Okay. I think that it might have started out with a lot of enthusiasm and it became very tiger-centric. I've been known as a tiger guy because since 1973 with Kailash Sankla, with everybody else, but I've also been mentored by the likes of Salim Ali. And he always said to me that birds are the ones that will give the largest number of livelihoods. Birds are the ones that perform the greatest services by distributing seeds, by controlling pests. If you were to ask me for a prediction, I would say that the tiger will step off podium one and go on to podium two and avians will come on to podium one. Dachigram is one of the world's best birding destinations. Every single tiger reserve is an excellent birding destination. So we are going out and we are using the tiger, which we should. As the tiger is the best, yeah, yeah. the best brand ambassador anybody could ask for, like the polar bear over here or like the lion in Africa, etc. But all the all the minute are filled in by the butterflies, by the birds, by the insects, by the, so. As far as birds are concerned, they are no less important than the tiger. The tiger would not survive without the ecosystem services given by the birds. The river is getting louder. I think we should try here somewhere else and talk. I think that and may not be a bad idea. I don't want to leave the river, but maybe we need to go to slightly yeah, more quiet And not place. try to outshout the river. No. I think that's a good idea. Absolutely good idea. There we go. Tachigam just gets prettier and prettier, like with every step. No? It gets I mean, what prettier. is this place? It is just, it is unfair almost to have a place that is so beautiful. It is truly so beautiful, and the thing is that when you come up here, just slightly yeah. above where the, yeah. the deep forest is, you realize that that forest depends upon these slopes. It's not just the forage for this, it's also the fact that these slopes, when the water comes down, it slows it down. So tell me, in this whole, uh, you know, tug of war between, uh, you know, push for growth and uh, protecting wild spaces, how do we find the middle path? Everybody wants growth. You have a, you're born as a child, your mother wants you to grow, mother wants you to get strong, mother wants you to be safe, your immune system is building up, your intelligence is mm. building up, your brain is getting adjusted. Then sometime around 17 or thereabouts, you stop growing. After that, physically growing. Mm. After that, if you keep growing, there's a word for it. It's called cancer. You don't want growth. You want growth which is in tune with life. So what's happened now is that 
human beings have become eating machines. We want to have more and more and more and more. And there are so many people who don't have it. Resource equity is not just a phrase to use in a classroom to teach, you know, young foresters or uh, tomorrow's bureaucrats something. Resource equity is a strategy for life. If you don't share, then those without any will take and they'll raid your castle, they'll break down your walls, they'll do all those things and why should they not? Human beings will be taught by nature. There's no middle path that human beings will voluntarily take. I think I, I've given up any hope that human beings will voluntarily do the right thing. We'll be smacked into doing the right thing and after that we'll get used to doing the right thing and after that we'll be happy doing the right thing. And who will be the heroes of tomorrow? They'll be the guys who, you can hear the Dagwan River down there. If, God forbid, the Dagwan River was actually to stop no glaciers, the forest cut down, then the person who brings this forest back working with nature will be the hero. Mm. So the heroes will change. Yeah. The investment bankers of tomorrow will not use money as coinage, they'll use water as coinage. Mm. There is no water left in India, yeah. Nega. And those who bring the water back, so we need to change our heroes. Yeah. You've also um, spoken about dams and how we're doing uh, in India, how our policy on dams is all messed up. Tell us why you think that that is not, certainly not the way forward and what are the pitfalls of hmm. damming every river uh, that is available? There's an economy to a free-flowing river. It's those economies that gave rise to human evolution, to human societies, to human religions. You can't go anywhere, hmm. anywhere in this country without seeing the equivalent of a shrine or temple at the source of a river. And if you look around you, what you're seeing here, these forests, these are not just forests. This forest is a dam. Between the forest and its roots, they're staunching the rain. The rain comes for four months and then it gently flows it into a river. Then the river has distributaries and it goes out like the veins and it supplies water to all creatures. As far as the dams are concerned, quite frankly, I'd rather have a carpenter do open heart surgery on me than have a civil engineer harvest water. A civil engineer does not understand hydrology as hydrology. He is not concerned. He is concerned with this mountain, this valley, putting this wall, getting so much. And his minders are making irrational promises. We will give you power. We will give you flood control, we will give you drought control, we will give you irrigation. Now that's ridiculous. If you want to keep your places protected from floods, you've got to keep the reservoir low. Mm. But the industries are saying we want the reservoir high because we want the turbines turned. Yeah. So what's going to happen? And if you keep the reservoir high for the industrialists, then when the water comes, how are you going to do flood control? Mm. So it's all contradictory. Mm. Frankly, it's fabricated. If you ask me, environmental protection is patriotism in action. So what happens to those who are not protecting the environment and actively destroying it? What yeah. would you call them? Yeah. I would call them desh Agreed. You know, Agreed. because our, our water security is at risk, our food security is at risk, our health security is at risk, our social security is at risk, our economic security exactly. is at risk. And also the thing that you, you know, you've uh, spoken about so often, right, which is that the economy is at risk and there is a direct link between the environment and the economy. You should read the Das Gupta report. I would actually put the Das Gupta report into simple one page, two page and teach it to 12 year olds, 11 year olds in school across the board. COVID-19 pandemic was a direct result of the illegal global wildlife trade. That trade is about $40 billion, $50 billion. The loss to the global economy was anywhere between 50 and 100 trillion dollars. Mm. I have no idea. 
So, you know, you've seen the evolution of science and wildlife communication for over 40 years now, given that you started Sanctuary about four decades ago. What do you think has changed since then in terms of how we're uh, communicating about this wonderful natural world? Do you think um, things have changed? Do you think they've remained the same? What are you hoping to see more of? The forest hasn't changed, but the way we are communicating mm. things about the forest has changed dramatically. That camera over there, mm. it has taken this to all parts of the world. The other thing that has changed is the information, this, this whole business of the internet. It's, it's, uh, it's been a radical change. Yeah. Way back in the 70s, just to get a small little piece on this page 5 on a newspaper, you had to really be so grateful for it. And today, social media has equalized a lot of things. So young people have be be begun to see things quicker. I think communication, both at a science level as well as at a public level, it's not in the same world. It's not the same planet. Mm. It's just completely different. The only thing is the planet is the same. Mm. So, you know, like I always tell you that our goals, you know, yours at Sanctuary and ours at Sustain is pretty much the same. So what would you want us to do more of? <laughs> Don't ask a kid what he wants in a candy shop. Okay? Always. <laughs> you can always ask him. <laughs> I'll, tell you, I'll tell you what I would like more. So I would love to see as much attention paid to producing films that entertain children and plant seeds in their head. Mm. So when they grow up, like these oaks and walnuts are growing, they're stronger. Absolutely, I agree. Done. No. So. You've been on the board of many organizations, government, non-government. How has it been working with politicians for you? <laughs> Look, it's a mixed bag. Mm. Politicians like you and me, we like jazz, somebody likes yeah. classical music. They're very nice people. But everybody has rationalizations, like you or I might have for our lives. Except their rationalizations make a difference to the whole world, to the whole, whole country. They'll go to Glasgow and make one promise and come over here and do exactly the opposite mm. because the rationale is if I'm not elected the next time mm. then what's the good of my doing all this? At exactly. least I know something so I'll do it. And it's a genuine feeling. Okay. It's not as though they're making it up. My biggest problem is with the Trojan horses. Within our own community there are people who just for getting a paper published, just for getting preferential access to a certain research mm. thing, when those guys compromise, I will never forgive them to the day I die because they are turncoats and I know them and I've seen them and, I've, and I still don't have personal hatred for them but my respect for them is zero. So tell me, you've travelled so much in the wild, you know, barring from the experiences that you told us at uh, Dajigam. What is the one memory that has stayed with you forever? One. You know, it could be something that made you really happy. It could be something that, you know, made you terribly sad. But one, one visual memory that stays with you forever. Uh, there are too many to pick and choose. But yeah. I will tell you one thing that, you know, Sanctuary was born under that famous banyan tree. Mm -hmm. And uh, Fatih Singh and myself, we were sitting around over there. And there was Helmut and Gertrude, these German photographers, wonderful people. We decided to stay on at the fireplace a little bit longer and Fateh had gone back in. And just literally, literally behind my chair, I just heard a scuffle, you know, like this. And then I, ah! that was all we heard. And all of us looked around and we thought maybe a monkey or something like this. And the fire had died down, so we put a few sticks in the fire and looked out. And... Clear as day, there was a blood trail. Five feet behind us, seven feet behind us, a leopard had picked up a sambar fawn. We were sitting down over there and talking. Wow. And uh, I went up to Fateh and said, Fateh, do you know what happened just now? So he said, You know, so, <laughs> so I said, No, Fateh, they're out. So he, so he he got out of bed and he wore his things and he came out and there enough. So I said, Jale. So he says, Pagale. So I said, Chalo, so jau. And the next day, so this is a memory etched in my head. Fateh was magic. He knew. He said that, Kal mil jayega. we'll just follow the blood trail and the scratch. And there it was. We found the rumen had been separated. It was a leopard that had taken. So that was one memory. And I could give you 64 more. You've done so many different things. You're a writer, you 
or a photographer, at least you were a photographer. I was. You're an orator, you, you're a conservationist. What is it that, if I told you at knife point, pick one, what would you pick? <laughs> Actually, I guess I'll only know on my deathbed. I have no idea who the hell I am, how I got here. I think John Lennon's fault, you know. He said, life is what happens to you while you make other plans. Correct. And uh, I've never had a plan. But I do wonder sometimes what the hell I did mm. to deserve to breathe the same air that a black bear breathes here, you know. Yeah. And every time I meet kids, you know, and they say that, I never saw a tiger and these kids are in there. Village kids, urban kids, mm. same thing. I said, do you know something? The tiger just passed by here. And what's the... And that sound you took. You have a tiger sound in your You know? We are bombarded with, you know, with news of terrible things happening every day to the environment, to yeah. this uh, natural world that you love so much. Yeah. Despite that, I've always seen that you're extremely positive. You're very non-cynical, which is so difficult. <laughs> How do you do it? Actually, it's true. My family tells me that all the time, that you're an optimist, you're an optimist. It's not a question of optimism. It's a question also of helplessness, you know, that mm. I can't do anything about it. Mm. So why should I let the acid burn my stomach about mm. something that I can do nothing about, you know? Yeah. And then at the end of the day, there's that one four-letter word called hope, you know. Yeah. And the truth is that my loyalty is not to homo sapiens. My loyalty is to this, to that, to this, yeah. and me, and homo sapiens. It's not exclusively homo yeah. sapiens. And the way I see it is that we don't yet have the technology to destroy the biosphere. We have the technology to destroy circumstances that make us comfortable. And I don't even know where we were headed with the conversation, but... Uh, this is exactly where we were headed. Were we? Right here, yeah. right now. Yeah. Vitu, this has been so wonderful. And, I mean, it has been, it has surpassed everything I, I'd imagined <laughs> it would be. Oh, so, well. this has been completely an honor. Look, I owe you a debt of gratitude because it's not often in these days that you get the time to sit back and think and remember and go through and rewind your life. So this has also been about all the people yeah. who've come and gone in your life and yeah. this is not only honouring you, it's honouring all of them as well. It's no? honouring all of them. Whatever it is, it's beautiful. It is. It is so... Why are we so damn lucky to live at this point the most exciting time of human history when we can actually turn from being the shits of the world into being people who actually live with this magic, you know? Completely. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's been three wonderful days, which sadly are now, uh, you have to go back and I have to go back. Yes, to our beautiful polluted cities. <laughs> Bilkul. But before we go, uh, we're going to do some really interesting things. So we have two little uh, fun sections uh, with you. Uh, fun section? Yes. Uh, the, for the first one, we've asked people who you've worked with in the past or you know really well, to ask one question that you will answer. So the help. first one is from Dr. Bivash Pandav. Okay? He says, which spirit keeps his spirit so high at his age? He shows no signs of aging. I saw him delivering a speech in an auditorium in Bhuvaneshwar as a young boy and I am now in my 50s. But Bittu seems to be stuck in his early 60s. What's happening? What is the secret? <laughs> I think unfinished business, I can't <laughs> afford to grow old, you know. Or no. you're not revealing your age. No, 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 I'll reveal it for the world. I'm 74 years old, going to be 75 years old. And uh, what keeps my spirit going? I don't know. I really don't know. I just love what I do. Okay, the next one is from Dr. Anish Andheria, who says, 
heard you were reborn in the Dal Lake. What's the story behind that? Oh God, it wasn't the Dal Lake, it was the damned Uti Lake. I was <laughs> all off five months old and my two elder sisters were fighting over who should hold the baby. And in the process, I fell over into the lake, off the boat. And uh, my father had to jump after me and he managed to save me and he managed to push me in. And there was a big drama, but the story is much longer. So Anish, it wasn't the damn Dal Lake, it was duty. And I went back and revisited it and I wasn't one bit scared of the damn lake. <laughs> so. Neha Sinha says, Bitu has always told me to focus on the bird and not the troubles of the troublemakers. He always says it's our duty to be happy. Who does he turn to when he needs to be happy? And she says in brackets, I know the answer, he will say nature. Ask specifically which person he turns to. Madhu. One word, that's it, yeah. right? Yeah, I think I got a sense of yeah. that even before. Uh, yeah. Also when I'm unhappy. <laughs> Correct. The next one is from Kara Tejpal, who says, you have a reputation for being the eternal nice guy. Has any conservation situation ever really made you lose your shirt? About a hundred times, two hundred <laughs> times. Name one. In the Ministry of Environment and Forests and Paryavaran Bhavan, at least fifty times. Once when I walked in, they clapped and said, Desh Bhaktaya, this is the only man who loves India. The rest of us hate India. So I said, you're probably right. When did you discover this? You know, so. Okay, so Lakshmi Raman, the next question is from her. I love her. I think they all love you too. Yeah. So She says, other than Gulab Jamuns, what is the one dessert that you cannot say no to? So easy. Notun Gure Sandesh. Wonderful. <laughs> and the last one, the last one is from me. Okay, considering uh, the last few days, I've gotten to know you a little bit. So my question is, if you had to, at gunpoint, choose between remembering all your passwords or handling tech for the next Sanctuary Digital event without any help, what will you pick? Shoot myself in the head. <laughs> that, those are two impossible tasks. Those are mountains I can't climb. I will not try to climb. I will always find a friend to help me out. Now, in the, in the course of the last uh, few days, you've told me several times that you, know, you want to be only around kids and around Gen yeah. Z yeah. and not with people yeah. of your age group anymore. Yeah. So here's a little test for you. Uh -huh. Okay. So these are all uh, Gen Z terms that people use on the internet today, oh these God. days. Okay, I hardly knew any of them. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to test you on whether you know you're keeping up with the lingo or the people you want to hang out with. First one, chalo. OG. Do you know what OG stands for? Oh God. No. no. I'll give you, uh, let me give you an uh, example in terms of how it's used. Bittu Segal is the OG of wildlife communication in India. In Punjabi, oh yes. No. No? No, it's not A G O G. <laughs> oh, OG God. is original gangster. Whoa, is that supposed to be a compliment or yeah, the other way like, around? It's like <clears throat> no, no man. I'm happy if they use anything they use which doesn't make me feel sad. I'm happy. <laughs> I made that made up that sentence. That's right. not how they're okay, using okay, it. Okay, okay, great. Acha, the next one is G O A T. Ah, I know that one, but it's I forgot. I know that I know that one. Try, try. Go on, go on. Uh, go on, on go on. Uh, no. Who do you think? Sentence to sort of uh, nudge you in the right direction. Who do you think is the goat of wildlife conservation in India? I know it, but I can't remember it. I know, I know exactly what it is because I think. Tara or Miel or somebody or maybe my grandson said something about it. It's me. greatest of all time. Greatest of all time. <laughs> Listen, I would have also flunked oh this. I'm just this one, I, this one I really flunked, <laughs> not because I hadn't heard it, but because I have an abysmal memory. All right, this this is easy. Okay. TBH. I'm 74 years old. Well, you want to hang out with the kids. TBH. Ah, uh, TBH. You want a sentence? Yes. TBH, this is the most beautiful forest I've seen in a really long time. Am I allowed to cry or? <laughs> I, mean, I have no clue. You're, you're allowed to have me laugh at you. <laughs> okay, yeah, you're already laughing at me, but what? To be honest. Oh God, TBH. to be honest. TBH. Yeah. 
So now next time. Okay, can I ask you a question? Yes. What's, what's JLT? Just like that. Oh shit, you know. That is very old. Okay. That's right, I was asking. I thought I knew it when I was 14. So how would you know it? That continued even when I was 14. Okay. Alright. Okay, next. Sus. How do you spell it? S-U-S. You said that's sus. God, I've got flunked exams <laughs> since I was 8 years old. Sus. I'm just now trying to guess, I'm trying to. Sus is short for something. Suspect. Very close. Suspicious. Suspicious. No, I get, <laughs> give me one point. One, one Chalo, point. I least. give you that. Right. Okay. Uh, last one. Stan. Stan. Hmm. Again, I could shoot Usage. myself. Huh. Is there a species that you stan? It's apparently used like that, okay? Some scientist guys use this. Young scientists. No. Then. Is there Gen a species Z. that you stand? I am using it in scientific uh, context and wildlife uh, context so that to make it more relevant is to you. There a species that you. Or is, is there a singer that you stand? Or is there an actor that you stand? I'm just feeling the size of an ant. I have no idea. Then None we have succeeded in our objective. <laughs> <laughs> just feeling completely shattered. I, I love kids, but I don't know a damn thing about what they're talking about. Okay, apparently, it is an overzealous fan of a particular celebrity or a thing. Stan. So, like, super crazy fan is a stan. Oh. Gela. Gela? No chance. But the crazy fan, basically. Stan. Yeah, stan. It doesn't have stupid as the first word, no. correct? Simply. Are no, it's not. Stan is that only. Oh, that? I, I didn't know. I thought you were still quizzing me. Oh, you horrid girl. Oh no, super, how does super zealous? I didn't know that, I was giving you the but definition. You can't do this to me, you know, you told me that you're reading out the letters no, and things like this, like action. Morse code and all that. Oh God. That was not an accident. I love it, I love it, I love it. Thank you, that was fun actually, that was fun. But I felt stupid. Just so it makes you feel better, I didn't know any of these myself. Oh, I knew one. God. <laughs> okay. Which one did you know? I knew OG. Original gangster, which I've already forgotten. forgotten. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you so much for doing this with us. This has been so much fun. Thank you for agreeing to go on this mad little adventure with us. Thank you for bringing us to Dachigam. Oh God, thank you for making me think about things I loved. To be perfectly serious, I've had a fantastic time. And I must say that you and your team are very fun to be with as well. Thank you and so much. Thank you very much.